Hello, everyone. Sorry, we are a little bit late to the party. Technical issues. Anything happens on live TV, though. These things do happen. I'm joined with Mike and I'm joined with Andy. Gents, how are we? Very good. Very good. Thank you. Good, thank you. How are you? Very good, thank you. So I'm looking forward to this live convo because we're going to talk about the stamp duty rumours and the six week extension that is obviously uh, being most spoken about in the press at the moment. We're going to talk about help to buy, the deadline changes. Andy, you're going to give us a bit of an insight into that and, and kind of what it all means, really. And then we're also going to talk about the landlord eviction notice. Um, Mike, that's where you're going to come into play. Uh, and we'll talk about the mortgage markets and a few other little bits as well. But if you're watching and you have got any questions whatsoever that relate to the property market, please, please, please chuck them in the comments and we will answer them as we go. Um, so, gents, if I go with you first, Mike, what do you think about all these rumours? Six week extension. Are we on? Are we looking like an extension? Is it a bluff? What do you think? Uh, well, I've had quite a long debate about with in, in LinkedIn this morning about this is, it was released in the Daily Mail, which automatically makes me mistrust anything that's ever printed. But I do feel like this was quite a, a purposeful government leak to, to to test out what people thought of it as a plan, um, known as flying a kite, I think, in government circles, just to throw it out there. What if this was to happen and see if there was a negative response to it? Um, so, yeah, I do think it was a genuine uh, proposal. Um, I actually think it's quite a sensible proposal because it will mean that anything that's currently in the pipeline that's likely to miss out by a couple of weeks um, and cause some upset or cause a fall through will will be caught. But it will mean that it doesn't cause another whole wave of transactions to go through and the same problem being happening again in three months or six months time. So I think there's a good chance that it is a true rumour. Andy, what about yourself? I mean, I, I know obviously your speciality is is new homes, but you've got two decades worth of property experience. So from your perspective, is this something which you think is going to happen? Do you, what sort of impact do you think it would happen if it does or doesn't? What's your take on it? Uh, firstly, thank you for the two decades. That's appreciate that. <laughs> appreciate that. Um, is it three? I think if they had an ex... <laughs> it's not... <laughs> you might be actually. Um, anyway, um, I think if they hadn't extended the help to buy, I would have said they're not going to do it. Now, what I don't believe they can do is extend the help to buy by six weeks, but not expend not extend the stamp duty by the same time because people are then going to have to pay stamp duty when they weren't forecasting they were going to have to do it if they were going to complete the end of March. So. I'm like, I think I'm with, with Mike on this, is that I think it's, they've thrown it out there to mute it to see what's going to happen. Um, as I said in my the, my the blog that I do, my Three Fact Friday on last week about mortgages and, and the like and help to buy, if they hadn't extended the help to buy, I'd be saying, I don't think they'll do it. The fact mm. that they've extended the help to buy and the help to buy is actually a government scheme, I think they can't not do it now for the six weeks. And the interesting thing, I guess, is is six weeks enough? Um, is that the end? You know, the end is the end. I think they will come on to the help to buy deadline extension in a second. But I think in the statement they made on that, they were very, very clear that that is, that is it. You know, that is the end of that deadline. Um, yeah. But with the stamp duty, I think potentially one thing that we've spoke about live before, I know myself and Mike and, and a couple of the other partners as well is, it needs a reform, doesn't it? It needs a. We need to use this as an opportunity to have a kind of total rethink of everything that's going on um, from a stamp duty perspective. I think hopefully we're all in agreement with that. Mike, yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's something that I I was quite forthright about in saying, if 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 you give a stamp duty holiday for six months and it shows that wave of people who want to move, it shows how many people were prevented from moving when the stamp duty was was there um so it's something that's a real preventative tax and it's not mm. to forget that every single house sale in the uk every single one that goes through contributes something like ten thousand pounds to the economy and there's over a hundred thousand property transactions a month so you just have to do that maths to say how important it is to the economy as a whole 
even with stamp duty aside, stamp duty can still happen. There still can be a tax on, on, on moving or buying property. But the way it is at the moment with average house price in the southeast and, and Wokingham, Bracknell, Warfield being close to that 500 mark, people paying £15,000 in cash, it stops people from doing it. I, I completely agree. And I know this was one of Andy's free fact Fridays recently talking about the impact that the housing market has on the economy in general. Um, and I think someone mentioned to me, oh, it, it, someone was quite negative on LinkedIn, actually, and said, well, all it's done is it pushed prices up and it's meant it's become more difficult for first time buyers. But I never think about the housing market based on prices. It's based on affordability, what are the interest rates doing and people move house based on their monthly costs rather than the cost of the house. Um, but Andy, from your point of view, um, being involved in kind of property and understanding from the trades perspective, do you think it's vital that they do something with the stamp duty to have an income, uh, sorry, an economic sort of growth for everyone in the trades and all the other industries that get sort of cooking when the housing completion goes through? Is, is that something that you think they're looking at, the bigger picture? Um, massive, yeah, yeah, massively. I think what they need to, what they, what they look at, and I think a lot of people who who aren't in the industry don't realise that the economy starts at the land sale. So as soon as a farmer, an owner, a landowner wants to sell that land, there's money going into the economy. So you've got the land surveys, you've got the architectural surveys, you've got the eco surveys going ahead, which are then contributing to the economy. You've then got the tender process, the people that do the tendering for the developments, you then got the build process, you then got the, the trades, you then got the sales process. So there's a, there's a massive, it's not just the trades, it's you go back a long, long way before you even get the trades involved. But, you know, mm -hmm. from a from a house sale point of view, there are so many different facets that are involved that for the housing market to take a dive and the housing market to slow down dramatically, would have a massive impact on the housing economy on the sorry on the, the on the not just the housing economy so i think that's what they're looking at i think this is why you know i think you've got to take your hats off to the government as well in terms of what they've done since um the the, the covid kicked in, in in trying to keep the housing market going because they understand how much it actually impacts the the, the economy so uh, i'm not going to make this political i'm not going you know, to stand on the fence and say you know boris is great but I think the way they've done it for the housing market has been has been very very good because it's kept things going, and I think it's testament to you know the tradespeople. You know, I've been on, on a number of building sites this week, and it's you know they're still COVID compliant in terms of what they're doing. Um, so, but they're keeping the economy going, and and the housing market, the sales from the housing market over the last eight to ten months, when we've all been in lockdown, we've all been pretty much shackled to our own desks, uh, you know, in our offices at home or doing what have you the housing market has still moved and that's testament to the fact that people haven't got to pay the stamp duty so if they want the economy to keep going and keep going because i don't think this covid thing's going to go away overnight we're going to be here for a, for a you know a good few months yet still even with the, the vaccines which are rolling out i think they've got to do something yeah makes sense no totally makes sense um lee's put the golden question in here that i've just highlighted uh, what do you think will happen to the housing market after stamp duty has ended even if it gets extended um it's a quick fire answer to this really you know i guess most of us will probably say we don't know the answer to that because things change in the property game at the moment almost weekly by weekly um but for me to answer Lee's question, I think the way that the banks and the mortgage markets are at the moment, with a reduction in interest rates happening almost weekly by big players, and the fact that we've got 10% deposit mortgages coming back into the market that weren't there at the back end of last year, that's given a first-time buyer market. So what will happen to the housing market? I think we're moving into a first-time buyer market. And I think if we go into a first time buyer market and first time buyers can come back in because it's affordable, that's going to help the bottom of the market get moving. It really then is going to come down to whether people want to move at the top to keep it going. Um, so I think it will be good for new homes because I think a lot of chains seem to get tied up by new homes at the moment. I think we've probably got 15 or 20 percent of our sales that we've got agreed at the moment. A new home is at the top. Um, and that would be my view on that, Lee. Mike, um, Andy, either of you guys got anything to add on on forecasting, Mystic Meg? I think, I, I think, um, I, I think you're right. I think that if if they can shore up the bottom, 
the rest will continue to the rest will continue to get better and better. Um, you need the help. You need the first time buyers. You need them to be the bottom rung of the ladder. Um, and you know, an Englishman's home is his castle. And we are, you know, even when you're at school, your aspirations are to to own your own house. And that hasn't gone away even from when I was at school. You know, many, <laughs> those many years ago. And we weren't writing on chalk before you say that, Ian. Um, it's you know, there's the aspiration is to own your own house. And houses are affordable now. Mortgage rates are affordable. They're, they're as cheap as they've been for for numerous years. Um, and developers are now getting to the point where they realise that because the market and the world has changed, they need to change what they're building. So it's not just a standard three-bed box that they're putting up. They're putting in things like, you know, home living space, home working space. The, the um, technology is an awful lot better that's going into houses. Um, so I think the developers have, have, have realised that even when we get out of COVID, we're going to be in a position where going into the office five days a week, six days a week, isn't necessarily what people are going to be doing or what employers are expecting people to do. They're going to be, as long as they're contactable, you know, 18 months ago, would we have been talking like this on a, on a, on a StreamYard call? <laughs> it just wouldn't have happened. Now, we, we have numerous calls through out the course of the week and the weekends on StreamYard, on Zoom and what have you. So why can't people do that? And why won't people be doing that when they move forward rather than driving two hours for a meeting when you can just do it in, sat in, your, in your study? And that's what developers yeah. have realised. And I think developers are, they're now planning. I mean, I, I had a meeting with a developer four, three, four months ago, and we went through some of the plans that they had, they had approved and they literally ripped them up. And I've gone back to planning to change the layouts of the houses to accommodate for home working. It's vital, isn't it? It's absolutely vital um, that people adapt hmm. to the trends and the changes. Mike, um, Chris is asking a question here. Do you think there'll be any news on the property market announced in the next budget, which is obviously on the 3rd of March? Um, one thing that we are expecting is, is obviously the stamp duty. Any, anything kind of further in detail on that? I don't know is the honest answer. There are rumours around landlords um, that, Rishi Sunak will look to start bringing some money back into his wallet from landlords. Um, so it's been mooted for the last two budgets that they're going to make changes to capital gains tax. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me if there are some changes and some tightening um, of, of, of tax breaks for landlords, which I know has been going on for the last four, five, six years in various different ways. Um, but yeah, we expect something to be announced for stamp duty short term. Um, long term, I don't think they've had the time. I don't think they've had the time to concentrate on ripping stamp duty apart and putting it back together again because there's there's bigger fish to fry um, at the moment. It might be something that's that's dealt with in the longer term. But short term, I, it wouldn't surprise me to see something on capital gains tax because... On the, the amount that the government has spent in in keeping people afloat, keeping businesses afloat, keeping individuals afloat on furlough at the moment is mind boggling. So it, it wouldn't surprise me to see, rather than income tax or anything like that, some of the stealth taxes move. Okay, good, good, interesting stuff. Um, I think we've covered stamp duty there. And if people have got questions, um, fire them in as we go. Um, we've got Andy on because help to buy. Help to buy has been something that's been going for many years now and, and with true success, I think, to get people on the ladder and get people moving. But I don't think everyone understands the changes. So, you know, help to buy one and two deadline changes. Andy, just give us a bit of a brief summary into how help to buy works. Not it, not the fact that it's a loan from the government as such, but how does it work and what's what's the changes and what's the recent news this week? Okay, so effectively you've got Help to Buy One, which came into effect, I think, 2013 and was extended to through to 2020 and then extended to March of this year. There's a new scheme, and we'll call that Help to Buy Two, so I'll talk in layman's terms. So Help to Buy One was the old scheme. Help to Buy Two is the new scheme. So Help to Buy One was due to finish at the end of March. Now, what that meant was that the building, the, the property you were buying, buying needed to be build complete by the end of February 2021 to enable completion for March 2021. What the government have done now is they've extended it to May, 31st of May, 
Now, I'm not sure if they're saying that the build complete needs to be finished by April, 30th of April, to enable the May completion. Um, but I think that's what you need. That's what I would be working on is is the property you're buying needs to be build complete, signed off and finished by the NHBC or whichever building regulator is signing it off by the end of April, the 30th of April, to enable completion for the 31st of May. That's my so understanding very, of it. But what I would suggest is that if you have got any queries, is speak to your solicitor, just to clarify. So there's two, there's, there's two, isn't there? There's the one and the two, there's the new version. So um, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. So, so help to buy one was, was open to everybody. So whether you owned a property before, um, was it, that was, that was helped by one, helped by two, they've changed the guidelines. So in the Southeast now, rather than buying up to 600,000, they've reduced that limit now to 436,600. So that's the limit you can go up to and you can only use help to help to buy if you're a first time buyer. And that comes into effect. Well, that's into effect now, but you can't complete on that until the 1st of April. Okay, good. Thank you for that. It's, it's good. But you, can it's start, you can start the process. You can start the process now. Good. Um, Emily's asked us a question. Is now a good time to buy? Some estate agents are saying wait a few months and uh, in hope the process lower. All confusing. Um, is it better to wait? Um, Obviously, everyone's got an opinion on the property market, and it's an interesting question. So do we think that if you're a buyer, it would be a better time to buy in, let's say, nine months compared to now? Um, obviously, the, the magic question and the advice that I think we have to give on this is no one knows the answer to that. But what we do know is that mortgage rates at the moment are reducing and that's giving positivity. What we also know is there's a lot less properties coming onto the market than what there were four or five months ago. And that seems to be having an impact in a growth of, I would say, properties sub 500,000. So it very much depends on where you're looking, what you're after and what price range. But typically at the moment, I don't know whether the banks will keep dropping these rates or whether they will hold, whether they'll go back up a little bit. Um, whether there be a change on the base rate. We don't know the answers to that. But at the moment, it seems like it's a very buoyant time um, to take advantage of the rates that are on offer from the banks and the deposits that you could potentially um, get mortgage products for at the moment are much um, lower than what they were before, which is a good sign as well. Um, Mike, any sort of take on that or any advice for Emily on that? Yeah, I think you're right. I think it totally depends on your own personal situation. Um, and I think a lot of people obsess over prices and, and that's fair enough. But I think what, what people have got to look at is, is if you're buying a family home for the next 10 years and house prices move a little bit over the next six months, really the, the relevance of it is, is very little. It's more about your affordability and your repayments. Um, your repayments right now have never been lower. So if you take out a fixed rate mortgage now, I'm no mortgage advisor, by the way, so this isn't advice. But if you take fixed rate mortgage out right now for the next five years, what happens to house prices over the next six months are, are irrelevant because you're living in your family home. You're using it as your family home. Um, rather, it's, it's not making money, losing money. It's not doing anything. It's, it's your home first and foremost. Mike, I'll come to you again. And sorry, Andy, because um, Lindsay's... Uh note here has kind of cut you in half there bud so apologies you raise your chair yeah just be a little bit taller next time please um <laughs> but serious, stuff, serious stuff here from Lindsay. She, she said um we've just been given six months notice on our rental house due to the landlord returning from his property abroad worrying times with a young family um do you think the rental market will pick up currently struggling to find a suitable property and this leads us nicely on to the news obviously that's come in recently mike on the eviction notice so with that in mind can you kind of lend lindsay with some advice and give us a bit yeah. of a brief on on the new eviction notice yeah so standard notices pre-covid were two months and there was a lot of noise about them being changed and and, and as soon as we went into the first lockdown um, notice periods were extended to six months to give tenants a lot more time um, in, a, in able to, 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 to enable them to move um, and, and give them some more security. And that's still happening. Um, and my opinion is 
because they were already discussing it pre-COVID, that's something that might stay permanently. So it's good for tenants and it gives more stability. Um, right now, Lindsay, I totally agree with you. It is really, really difficult to find the property because as tenants, if you don't have to move, you, you probably won't. Um, if you're in a nice three to four bedroom family house with a garden, you're unlikely to up sticks and, uh, and go down the road for something slightly different. So very few rental properties have come available in the last six months or so. What will trigger um, an uptick in the rental market is firstly, a lot of house transactions are going through this month and next month. And a lot of those are buy to lets. So probably, I don't know, in a quarter of, of properties being sold at the moment, maybe 20%, 25% will be to people who are looking to rent them out or indeed rent out their own home to move into a new one. So it stimulates, it brings new rental properties to the market. The other thing that will bring more properties to the market is an easing of lockdown, pure and simple. Um, so what, what will what will give me people more confident is increasing the vaccines and, and and more freedom because more freedom will bring more movement so from from our point of view i do believe it will get easier through easter onwards because there will be more properties come available we know from the houses that are completing that we're listing rental properties because we've got families who are moving on taking advantage of the stamp duty holiday to buy another family home rather than pay the masses of stamp duty if you're buying a second property, that's normally relevant. So, Lindsay, my honest answer is yes, I do think it will get a little bit better. Not as much as normal, but better. Thank you for that, Mike. It's good insight. Um, going to cover mortgage markets. I was going to talk about that, but I think we've got into the market and there's been some great questions. So a couple of quick fire questions. I'll go to Andy, then I'll go to Mike. Um, do we think on the 3rd of March there will be a six-week extension on the stamp duty? Straightforward, yes or no, Andy? Yes, but don't help me to it. Okay. Uh, Mike? Uh, yes, but I won't be in Labrooks putting the money down on it, a bit like Andy. <laughs> okay, I'm going yes as well. So we've got three yeses on that. We're all expecting a six-week extension on the stamp duty. But don't budget for it and then come and blame us um, because we don't make the decision. Um, what about banks? Banks are dropping rates. Mortgages are dropping rates, building societies. Do we think that will continue for the rest of the short term future, next couple of months at least? Um, do we think banks are going to continue to drop their interest rates like they seem to have been doing on theme so far this year? Um, Andy? I think, bearing in mind the amount of lenders and the amount of schemes that are currently currently available, they are competing with each other. So whilst the, whilst the housing market continues to sell at the rate it's selling, I think the rates will come down. Okay. Because there's yeah, um, yeah, I think yeah, the, the, there's a hundred lenders, and this and some of these facts which sort of which I found out last week that sort of literally blew my mind is that there are a hundred mortgage lenders in the UK housing market with over 3,215 individual mortgage schemes available. So they're competing so with each other. If you're a buyer and you're thinking, right, I'm about to do my budget, my fact find, where do you start with that when you've got that amount of mortgage products? You know, what, what's your advice you on need that? To, and I don't yeah. know if we can plug people not, here, but you know, yeah, I mean, my my advice is, yes, you can go to your high street bank. They're going to sell you their product. If you go to an independent financial advisor who's got access to all of the markets, they've got, they're not tied to one lender. They're not tied to one building society. They're not tied to one bank. They can find you. They can do the legwork for you. They get, in the majority of cases, they will get the money or commissions from the lender rather than you having to pay them. So you're employing somebody to do quite a bit of legwork to save you a bit of money so that would be my advice that that's what i would do it, it's if, it, if i was a buyer who didn't know anything about the housing market first and foremost i would get in touch with an independent financial advisor and you know if you like them you know if you get on with them and they're the ones that you want to be speaking to the ones that you like the ones that you you know will do you 
a favour, not do you a favour, but will be working for you rather than working for themselves. Good, solid advice. Um, Mike, yay or nay, they're going to continue to drop. What do you think? Uh, short term, I think they might, yeah. Um, and yeah, just on Andy's point, I am a buyer and I do know quite a lot about the housing market, but I would still use an independent financial advisor because they will know which bank suits my needs. Um, everyone's got their own their own individual needs. I'm self-employed. I don't know which bank suits me for self-employed, but my financial advisor certainly does. Absolutely. Yeah, completely agree. And my gut feeling is that we will see these interest rates continue to reduce as well. Um, so I just want to say thanks to, um, to Lindsay, to Emily, um, to Chris, to Lee for all the comments. Hello to Rael, to Rob, to Mark. Um, and to another Chris as well that have all said hi this evening. Um, and the last quick fire question that um, I think based on last night and where we sit at the moment, I'm quite confident to talk about is who do we think will get in the top four this season? Um, anyone sort of brave enough <laughs> to think that Man City are not going to uh, not going to win the league? But what would be your top four, Mike? And, and this will go on record. So, um, Mike, top four, talk to me. I'm hoping... Leicester and West Ham. Wow, okay. And throw and it out there. City, Leicester, West Ham. And, and and the fourth? City, United, Leicester, West Ham. In that order, yeah? Okay. Um, Andy, can I get yours, please? As a Leeds fan, it definitely won't be Man United. They won't be in the top four. Um, okay. It's def definitely City, definitely Leicester. I think Liverpool will turn it around. Okay. And unfortunately, the. Yeah, Chelsea. <laughs> yeah. Good lads. Yeah, I think it's I think it's City's league this season. I think Chelsea are definitely going to come second. Um, by far and away, the better team compared to the rest of the clubs out there at the moment. Um, very evident, I would say. And um, yeah, I'm hoping for uh, Leicester and West Ham. That would be that would be a nice top four, wouldn't it? There we go. That wraps up this evening. Um, as always, gents, it's been a pleasure. And um, thanks for everyone that's watched. If you're watching later on, we're not live. Don't forget, still ask us a question um, and we're happy to answer. Um, and Lindsay, if you're still watching, get in contact with us and we'll, um, we'll start the search for you um, because we do know properties that are going to come through and complete down the line. So we're, we're happy to try and help you as well. Have a good evening, gang. Cheers. Thanks a lot.